Hi, I'm Ray Locker. Uh, I'm the National Security Editor at USA Today. I'm proud to say I'm also a longtime friend of Len Kolodny. Worked with him uh, since uh, I met him almost 20 years ago when I worked in Tampa, Florida, which is where Len lives now. Uh, been involved with Len on this book, talking with him for a long time. Worked with Tom on it too. Uh, really proud to, to see this book come out and I think that we'll have a lively discussion, interesting discussion because there's so much that's in this book that I found new and I think you'll find new as well. What I'd like to do is engage Tom and Len in some questions about you know what's in the book, what they've learned and then about halfway through open it up for questions that you may have and um, we can take it from there. I'd like to start off with talking to Tom about Tell us about some of the broad strokes that you found in the book, uh, the main points that people should okay, take away. Thanks, Ray. Uh, first, I'd like to say that all titles are an absurdity. We, they never cover the subject matter totally, and uh, that, that's very true in this, in this book. Uh, what we set out to do here was to get some sense of how foreign policy was made and why uh, over the last 40 years. And uh, not in a, in a dry academic way, but in a way that says who did what and why did they do it. And we found that there were the two very large camps, shall we say, of, of people. And in one camp uh, was Richard Nixon, uh, who was a pragmatist, to end all pragmatists. He really, d um, when he came into office, he overturned the foreign policy of the previous quarter century in a way that, that went against his former principles in order to get something done that he thought needed to be done. Uh, so there was there, throughout this period, there's a whole series of people who are, who are pragmatic in their outlook. And on the other hand, there are a whole series of people who were uh, much more ideological than that, who felt that foreign policy should proceed from a particular moral basis uh, or values based basis and uh, they found a lot of what Nixon was doing initially uh, to be anathema. Uh, his attempt at detente with the Soviet Union, uh, with the attempt to open up what was then called Red China, and the third strand which he also had decided upon before he came into office, uh, an attempt to very quickly draw the Vietnam War to a close. Uh, he obviously was not able to do that as quickly as he wanted. But on the other two fronts, he succeeded rather admirably in opening things up. And by doing so, he sort of galvanized whole generations of people who were fundamentally anti-communist. Um, these were people on the right, both in the Democratic Party and in the Republican Party and in any other party that, that, that was then around, uh, who had spent the previous 25 years um, working their lives out against communism and the idea that, that you could suddenly throw that over and, and open up discussions and, and perhaps even make concessions to communist countries, uh, this, this, was, this was an amazing thing to them. And they coalesced and they did more than impact foreign policy. Uh, as we contend in this book, uh, there's actually a very strong element of uh, their helping to undermine the Nixon presidency in a way that helped to bring it down. The, the, the mythology is that, that the, pres the Nixon presidency ended because of a conspiracy on the left. That the media and Nixon's old enemies uh, brought this administration to a close. We think that has to be amended, and we show you exactly why in this book. Uh, there are many other strands that, that are in there. And one of the most important were the people who opposed Nixon because of his foreign policies. Not because of who he was, but because of those policies. And this war, which we call it, and we think it is a war, uh, continued on through the, the Ford and Carter administrations where the foreign policy was, was basically a Nixonian foreign policy. It was a continuation of these things, both by Carter, the Democratic president, and by Ford, who was Nixon's immediate successor, the Republican president. Uh, that calculus didn't really change until the early Reagan years when the people who had been the staunch anti-communist, who were by now known as neocon, uh, came into power. But we have to say they didn't come into the first rank of power. Uh, they came into the second and third ranks, uh, the first ranks of power 
were held by more moderate people. We're not used to thinking of Reagan as a moderate, but in, in foreign policy terms, uh, he ended up being quite a moderate. Uh, so much so that by his second term, uh, the neocons were very angry at him. What are you doing going out there and, and meeting Gorbachev and, and setting new agendas and for heaven's sake trying to get rid of nuclear weapons in the world? This, this is not what we thought you were, we hired you to do. Um, and then the pendulum swung back to pragmatism under George H. W. Bush, who was an extremely pragmatic man uh, with a tremendous uh, sense of what was needed to be done in the world. He put together a coalition, the likes of which uh, would had never been seen before in the history of the world, to take on a specific enemy at a specific time and place. And the neocons were all for that, except that he didn't go all the way to Baghdad. And George H. W. Bush felt that he couldn't go to Baghdad, and we show you why, uh, because principally because that whole coalition would have fallen apart. So the neocons went back into their habitual posture, which is, we're the greatest criticizers of foreign policy the world has ever seen. We do a terrific job on that, of selling you what the alternative is. Uh, throughout the uh, the Bill Clinton years. Uh, steadfastly all through that time, if you wanted to find an alternative way of looking at the world and what ought to be done in the world, the neocons were there to provide it. And only during the administration of George W. Bush did they really, were they really able to come to the fore and utilize their power uh, through guys who were not necessarily neocons, through Bush and Cheney and Rumsfeld, who were, were not in the neocon uh, camp of, of uh, academics and, and uh, newspaper editorial writers. Uh, and this is the arc that we trace in this book in great detail. And uh, we tell you a lot about some very interesting people. And I think I'd better stop now and maybe Len can fill you in okay. on the most interesting character there. Yeah, there's one person, Len, who's in the book that while the many of the people, many of the characters are familiar to most readers, there's one person whose name has been obscured for years and whose role you and Tom discovered uh, during your research. Tell us who, who this person is and what he did. Well, when I finished writing, writing my first book, Silent Coup, I came away with this really nagging question. And I didn't have an answer. And I couldn't explain it. And then there was one other question that nagged a little bit, but not as much as this one. How did the Republican Party go from detente to the evil empire in less than a decade? That was the gnawing question that got me to write the book. Because that's what 40 Years War does. 40 Years War explains how you could go in less than a decade from detente to the evil empire. And that decade is a fascinating decade. Because while we were for containment for 25 years, from 1945 to 1970, once Nixon started down the detente path, and as his enemies coalesced, there was a battle. And it took many forms, inside the administration, outside the administration. After he left, the Ford-Reagan primary was part of that war. Ford backing detente, or sometimes having to back away from detente, and, and Reagan pushing the uh, hard on the hawkish side. Carter comes in and they begin again to attack. But the, the, what's important to, to note here is there is a political revolution going on. The Democrats had moved left with George McGovern, forcing the Scoop Jackson Democrats, who would become the neocons in, in 1980. They began to try to take the party back when that failed from 76 to 80, they moved and coalesced with the, re with the Republican conservatives and formed what would become the Reagan Revolution and, and impact the next 30 years of, of American foreign policy in one form or another. So that was the key question in my mind. And then there was one other question. Because I was intrigued by the way Nixon was maneuvered out of the White House, from inside the White House by General Haig, I kept wondering who recommended he get Haig for, you know, how did Haig get to the White House? And in searching around in, in 2006 after uh, Bush had been reelected, 
I called Roger Morris, who had worked in the National Security Council with Kissinger and Haig, and he threw out a name that I'd never heard before. He said, it may be a fellow named Kramer. And he went on to explain that he was a fellow over at the Pentagon who was Henry's mentor, Henry Kissinger's mentor. 